This talented tuba student plays very well. He breathes efficiently, has a strong sense of musicality, and has good flexibility. He also has an embouchure problem that has caused hurdles in his playing technique that he hasn't yet been able to overcome. Can you spot the problem? If you weren't able to spot the problem, we'll take another look at that player after a bit. First, I want to show you some embouchure characteristics that many teachers and players are unaware of and compare and contrast some different players. Using functioning embouchure patterns as a guide, it's possible to spot the actual cause of an embouchure difficulty and even correct troubles before they begin to cause real problems. Before I do so, however, I want to address a couple of common concerns. First, there is a widespread opinion that it is much better to focus on breathing than embouchure. Looking at the embouchure closely shouldn't imply that breathing is unimportant to good brass playing, it definitely is. Breathing is, however, much better understood by most teachers and therefore receives much more attention. I'm merely recommending we add another tool to our toolbox, not replace what's already effective. The other criticism I often get is that brass embouchures are too complex to consciously control and that trying to do so will lead to paralysis by analysis. I'll try to challenge this assumption here and show examples of where some conscious analysis and embouchure control can have a positive effect. I'll also show some cases where problems develop because of a lack of understanding of embouchure form and function. The last point I want to make before I begin my discussion of brass embouchures is that it's important for us to remember that musical expression is our goal. Instrumental technique is a means to a musical performance, and not the end in and of itself. There is a time and place for analysis, but also a separate time and place for focus on being a good musical communicator. When analyzing different players' embouchures, it's useful to look for similarities, but we should also consider the differences. Every person has unique anatomical features. The shape of a player's tooth structure obviously has an effect on the player's embouchure, but other features can also come into play in sometimes surprising ways. Some players have very wide lips and others are narrow. Some players have very thick lips and some are very thin. Some players have long upper lips in relation to their teeth, and others have very short upper lips. Some players have a lot of room on their upper lip or chin to place the mouthpiece where others find their nose or chin to get in the way. These, and other less obvious anatomical features, will have a sometimes unexpected effect on how an individual's embouchure functions. The first embouchure characteristic I will cover is the embouchure's airstream direction. Many brass musicians use terms upstream and downstream to refer to the player's horn angle. Use of a transparent mouthpiece will show that there are examples of downstream performers with a horn angle that is quite high and also tilted down, and likewise for upstream brass players. While a player's horn angle is an important part of their embouchure, it plays no role in the direction the airstream passes the lips into the mouthpiece. Downstream embouchure players place the mouthpiece with more upper lip than lower lip inside the cup. Because the upper lip predominates, the airstream will strike the mouthpiece cup below the shank. The precise angle the airstream travels depends on the individual player and also the register being played. When a downstream player plays higher, the airstream will be blown at a sharper angle and the air will strike closer to the rim. As the player plays lower, the airstream will strike the mouthpiece cup closer to the shank of the mouthpiece. When a player places the mouthpiece with more lower lip inside, the reverse situation happens. The lower lip will instead predominate, and the airstream will strike the mouthpiece cup above the shank. 
opposite of downstream embouchures. When an upstream embouchure plays into the high register, the airstream will strike the cup even higher and strike closer to the shank when playing lower. Players who place the mouthpiece close to half and half always have one lip or another predominating, and the airstream will either get blown upstream or downstream, sometimes even flipping airstream direction. In spite of some musicians' descriptions of their playing sensations, there really aren't any brass players who blow straight down the shank of the mouthpiece. Placement off to one side or another is also not uncommon. The best mouthpiece placement for an individual is quite personal and should be based on what is comfortable and works efficiently, not on what looks most centered. The second embouchure characteristic that I'll discuss is what I'll be calling an embouchure motion in this presentation. Whether or not the musician is aware of it, all brass players will slide the lips along the teeth with the mouthpiece while changing registers. It's important to note that the placement of the mouthpiece on the lips don't change, but rather the mouthpiece and lips together get moved to a different relationship on the teeth behind them. Most brass players are unaware that they do this at all, yet all players seem to have an embouchure motion when you look closely enough. The direction of the embouchure motion is personal to the individual, but the general motion tends to be in an upward and downward direction. This trombonist has an embouchure motion to push up towards the nose to ascend and pull down towards the chin to descend. This trumpet player has a similar motion up to ascend and down to descend. Some players, however, do the opposite. This trumpet player pulls the lips and mouthpiece together down towards the chin to ascend and pushes up to descend. It's not uncommon for the track of the embouchure motion to be slightly to the side. My own embouchure motion is to pull down and to my left to ascend, and then push up and to the right to descend. When looking closely at a large number of brass players' embouchures, three basic patterns emerge. These three basic embouchure types don't represent a particular practice method, but are simply models that describe what can be seen with virtually every brass player. Before I go any further, I want to clarify that I feel the correct embouchure type is a factor of each individual player's unique anatomy, and really nothing else. There are examples of world-class brass players of all three embouchure types and in all fields of music, ranging from classical to jazz. Since each of these three basic embouchure types function differently, teachers will want to understand what constitutes good embouchure form for each of these three types. <laughs> 